Okay, so um, yeah, we will slowly start, I think, and um, <clears throat> just allow other people to join us as they come. Um, so welcome um, to the to the, our webinar. Um, thank you for joining in. Um, I will just say a few words about myself first, so you have a bit of an idea about me. Uh, my name is Marta Jomuszewska and I, I work at OSP Response. Um, I've been there for less than nine years, almost nine years now. Um, I first started at the, uh, the business development department and then I moved on to become a regional rep for Europe and Caspian region. Um, and for the last three years, I'm with consultancy department. Um, I do a lot of, um, you can call side projects uh, with OSRL in terms of um, plastic um, the response and uh, and surveillance core group as well and, and some uh, another interest of mine is also the diversity equity and inclusion subjects which we have an internal group in OSRL that works on that subject um, and my presentation is kind of a, um, a, a, a combination between the instant command uh, system with the DNI lens on it uh, so it's it's kind of a a little bit different way of looking at the leadership and and anything that can affect it um, my background, educational background, is in oceanography and um, political science. So again, a bit of a mix of the two. Um, so throughout the uh, presentation, um, I will show you some slides and some of the research and, and um, things that I gathered to, to prove some of the points I will be talking about. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I think it's best if we take the questions, leave the questions and, at the end. Uh, but please feel free if something comes to your mind, just to write it down in the chat so we can then refer to it at the end. Um, OK, so I will just uh, share presentation with you. OK, let me see if you can see it well. Some thumbs up. Yep. Yeah. OK, great. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, the subject is, um, are we biased against our best leaders? So um, so basically we'll be talking about how bias can affect the leadership uh, and decisions that leaders make in terms of how they recruit their teams, but also how team sees their leaders or how they choose them. So before we get to the main presentation, I also wanted to do a short exercise uh, with all of you. And I can I cannot see you because your cameras are off. But uh, what I would like you to do is just to either close your eyes or just focus on my voice um, and think about the first thing that comes to your head when you heard me talking. So did you notice my accent first? Um, did you if you were to imagine how I look based? Well, now you can see me, but if you were imagined to just um, uh, listen to my voice and, and imagine how I look, what what would you think as I look as um, you know, as a, as a person, um, if I were to be introduced to you as a as a as an instant commander on the phone call uh, and you would hear my voice, would you have trust in my skills? Would you would think maybe she's quite young? Maybe she's a woman? Does it matter? Is it you know what? What would your feelings be if, if this would be the case? So th these are some of the questions that uh, we're kind of looking a bit closer later parts of the presentation. So we will dive a bit deeper into this bias uh, that can influence the leadership. So starting at, um, at the beginning with the bias, uh, what the bias actually is, uh, it's a particular tendency, trend, inclination, feeling or opinion, especially one that is preconceived or unreasoned. And we have two types of bias. There is one that is implicit, which is an unconscious one. And there is an explicit one, which is the conscious one. So the unconscious one is often done without realizing. So typically based on our worldviews or experiences that we um, we were we came across when we were growing up, uh, potentially you know the place that where we were born, we were raised, that affects quite a lot of our unconscious bias. The conscious one, um, as it as it stands, is done intentionally and knowingly. So it's an active choice that you will you will be biased against someone or something. So most of us will will have both, even though we like to think that we are not really biased and we are really fair. But most of the time it is the fact that both we all have both of the biases, both the unconscious one and the conscious one, uh, even if we don't tend to speak about it. So now how does it play when it comes to the, the bias of the leaders and the team members? So typically our willingness to follow a crisis leader 
will depend on if we judge them worthy. Uh, so if our perception, it also depends very much, it's very linked to the, our perception of worthiness. Uh, is it based on the known performance or is it based on our biased assumptions of who should be leading? Um, so, for example, we might be biased again against people of certain age, gender or racial group, and we may question their ability to be an effective leader. Maybe not trust them uh, that they will represent our interests because they are not similar to us. Um, equally, uh, looking from the other perspective of the team leader, the leader can overlook team members who are different based on external factors, you know, such as age, Rate, age, race, um, sex or uh, disability or gender rather than sex. Uh, in an oil and gas industry where the employees are mostly male, um, we will see these characteristics of a leader or a person that should lead us mostly as a male, uh, you know, older guy, professional looking figure. Um, so with that in mind, as a result, females actually and different racial and ethnic backgrounds, uh, young people will have less opportunities to be equally included um, and it's not only equ equally included in the team, but also in the career pathway that can lead them to become a leader. So it's not only unfair, it also means that we are missing out on quite a large um, talent pool that can be used. So um, the other point that uh, to make in here also is that if we don't trust the leader um, because of the bias that we might have against them, we will waste our time to question their instructions. We will we will try to um, maybe question some of the things they do. We will not necessarily be quick to follow the orders. Um, so we will just not listen it. And, and that makes the command less efficient. So it comes from both ways, both the leader, leader's perspective, but also the team, uh, team members as well. So, um, like I said, every one of us has a bias. Uh, there was an interesting study, well, two studies actually done uh, by by one of the researchers. One of one of them was done by the researchers at the uh, Ontario Institute in Canada, um, and some of the collaborators included people from or researchers from US, UK, France, and China, and they showed that six to nine months old infants demonstrate raci racial bias in favor of members of their own race and racial bias against those of other races. And the way how they prove that is that um, they begin to us that infants begin to associate uh, own race faces with happy music and the other race faces with a sad music. So they tend to be um, associating something happy with when they saw people that are similar to them. Um, and also what they also found is that the six to eight months old infants were more inclined to learn information from an adult that looked similar to them. So that's already a bias showing at such an early age. Um, as an adult, we use what we call this mental shortcuts. Um, and that's something that we were equipped for in the time of our evolution uh, as a homo sapiens, you know, trying to survive the hostile environment. What it means is that there is this rapid processing that occurs when our brain makes the quick judgments. Uh, and we make quick judgments of people, of situations around us, just to understand whether it is a danger to us or not. And that's something that sits deep in us and it's quite difficult to change because that's just how, how we operate, how our brain operates. Um, and this can lead sometimes to unconscious bias, depending on how, you know, what a kind of biases we were exposed to. And that will be linked, like I mentioned, to our background, our culture, our personal experience. Um, it can also mean that these biases can lead to outgroups, outgroups being treated less favorably and even discriminated because we don't see them as being one of us. So we will not, you know, we will not want them to be included. So there are these two, two things that we should bear in mind. So how does it do, how, the, how is it connected to the leadership bias? And I have some question um, that I prepared in here. So please feel free to, uh, to give your answers in the chat. Um, I will ask question first and then I will wait to get some ideas from you. Um, first of the question is when one in 10 senior leaders at their company is a woman, what percent of a man and what percent of a woman think women are well represented in leadership? So one in one in 10 senior leaders is a woman. So what do you think men think? Is it a lot of women or is it not a lot of women? And the, again, what women think, if it's a lot or not. If you just can give me a, a percentage, let's say, I don't know, men think it's they are represented 50% or 100% or so. 
someone someone's typing let's see okay okay that's interesting simon <laughs> So we have 50 from men and 10 from women from Simon. Uh, Pradi Kumar said 50%. I'm not sure if it's men or women. And then Einar said 70% men, 30% women. So, okay. So we saw a bit of a, we can see a bit of a bias with, with men thinking it's quite a lot, 20%. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Just waiting for Eric. Okay, that's uh, interesting. So the answer that comes from the research is actually 44% of men and 22% of women. So men thought, you know, almost half half of the men thought that it's quite a good representation of women, having one woman in 10 men, whereas women thought it's 22%. They agree with that. So it's um, some of you were quite close to that number, actually. Um, Eric, that's quite interesting statement. You would, it would be interesting to hear. Um, what's standing behind that as well. OK, um, I'll get to the next question. So how many times more often do men interrupt women than other men? This is more in, in times rather than percent, so you can say one time, two times, three times, okay? Two to one, okay. <laughs> Robert, you know the answer, you shouldn't be answering that. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. So that the answer is actually three times more often. So, so women are interrupted three times more often than men when they speak. Well, actually, Robert didn't remember it very well. It's it's free. <laughs> OK, let's get to the next question then. Um, how much more likely was a woman to get an interview if her resume pictured her without a hijab compared to picturing her with a hijab? Okay, that's quite high. So we have five, seven, five times, three times, 70%. Okay, let's see the answer now. So it's actually three times more likely. So you were you were going higher with what, <laughs> what the answer actually was, but it also shows that um, you know you have awareness of the situations and, and it happens, and unfortunately it happens quite often. Okay, the last one then. In one study, job applicants with white sounding names got what percentage more callbacks than identical job applicants with black sounding names? That's the percentage again. Very good. Thank you, Einar. Okay. Great, thank you for that. So the answer is 50% more. So you were quite close with um, with your numbers, actually. Um, so that kind of shows you that there is quite a lot of um, bias around there. And, and, you know, regardless of what we say about the fact that people are not really biased, it, it, it you know, the numbers are there. So how this all links into the leadership bias. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the Harvard Implicit Association test. Uh, so this, there are really interesting tests available online. All, you can, you can, all of us can do it. Uh, and you can test different kind of uh, implicit associations uh, with, uh, re re related to different subjects. So there are some about whether you are um, biased or, or you have some kind of association against the race. Um, against women or gender in general, there's a few more. There isn't one that relates strictly to leadership, um, 
but out of the other um, some of the other research um, that leads to uh, a career, uh, seventy six percent of us tend to associate male with a career and female with a family. So it kind of gives you an idea of like when you watch um, when you do the test, uh, you have to link different things with and then it measures your reaction time. Uh, and that's basically what what was what came out of it. So seventy percent of us associate male with career and female with family. So what we expect is to men men to be more career focused, uh, and we expect we expect them to be more in charge. So so basically that's what it means. And then with women, we always think they should be more focused on the family rather than the, their career. Um, and then you know that's that's kind of a a source of a lot of questions that comes why things are more male dominated, and whether we will take instructions from women as readily during an incident. OK, so now moving on with um, the characteristics of good leaders. So if you think about, you know, how what kind of characteristics you would like for your good leaders to have. So the first thing comes to mind and, you know, some most of these are based on um, the research or the, the the study that was done following the Macondo. So it relates to the, the commanders and the, the leaders that were there uh, during the Macondo incident, the oil spill in, in Gulf of Mexico. So what they said is they they expect good leaders to have a knowledge. Uh, they expect to be effective during prior events, so they have some um, experience previously, and also demonstrated capacity to function under pressure. So the three things that were mentioned were these. So, um, but also studies shows that we are actually quite biased on how we interpret experience. So if someone fits our profile, uh, then we think if if someone fits our profile as a leader, then we think they are actually more experienced than someone who is has identical experience, but doesn't necessarily fit that profile. So we already kind of show a bias then, even though you know we don't know how good the leaders they are. Uh, so you know if you think that maybe you are selecting someone um, uh, on amount of knowledge that they have, but it's actually quite open to interpretation. So studies shows that we judge those that do not fit our image much harsher uh, of who could fill, fill the role. Um, uh, the ones that we don't really fit our image, we will we will judge them more harshly than the ones that fit. So that's that's basically what it is. So um, and also what was interesting is that um, and on one study, when a woman's name was replaced with a man's name on the resume, uh, they were actually 60 percent more likely to be hiring that applicant just from the change of the name. So what we should really question ourselves is where whether we are truly objective in the way how we can see how we see the leaders and how we position ourselves to make the choices and whether our choices are objective and you know the way how we look at the leaders um, is already biased or whether we are actually objective. So the slide was on how what we think the characteristics are and then the next one is what the characteristics actually are. So based on you know, the studies and, and some of the um, uh, research done, so good leaders are actually not remembered by their actions uh, uh, or what they said in particular moment, uh, but mostly how they made their team members feel. Um, so it's, it's about the feeling that you get from your leader. It's about the fact that you are being heard. It's about the fact that you know, um, you don't, you're not afraid of them. You can talk to them. So, um, when it comes to men versus women leadership, um, it's it's not just that that we are looking at we are looking broader as well. But this particular case is if we were to compare the two style of leaderships, uh, many people tend to describe women as more caring, more communicative, team building, multitasking in style, whereas men would be more describing as the leaders who are more commanding, controlling, uh, more competitive, and focus on on uh, on results on on the tasks. Um, but what we should what, what we should actually do is um, walk away from that leadership style based on the gender, um, because it it puts quite the stereotypical frames um, where you know in some cases women uh, leaders who are hard, uh, demanding or competitive, or men who are more nurturing or team orientated, they, they they are seen as a deviation, and that's something I don't know if you. Um, I read one book about the woman leaders, and that was uh, that was one of the arguments they made there. That you know, if woman doesn't fit the the typical woman leader doesn't fit the typical woman image, she's seen or she's judged more harshly. 
Um, so that's quite interesting because, you know, even though she's really effective as a leader, but because she doesn't fit, she doesn't fit the stereotypes, stereotypical, stereotypical frames of a woman, she might not necessarily be judged as fair as if she would be a man, for example. So what it means is that diversity in leadership doesn't mean that, you know, we should have more female leaders. That's not what we are striving for. What we try to do is that we should extend this beyond the gender frames and, and biases and, and stereotypes and focus on merit. So people are good in what they do, and that's what uh, that's the basis that we are choosing them to do. So um, you might know this lady um, here on the slide. Uh, her name is Jacinda Ardern, uh, and she's a prime minister of New Zealand. So what was interesting is that if you read the, the news uh, that describe her leadership style, this is what they, they wrote about her. Um, so Ardern is imperfect and her government usually struggles to implement its agenda, whether house building or climate change action. But one aspect where the prime minister and her government excel is dealing with an immediate crisis. And that was something that she proved um, during some of the uh, the attacks that happened in New Zealand on the mosque and also during the COVID crisis. So uh, it's quite interesting that, you know, even though the media uh, judged her as being not really effective as a government, as a leader of the government. However, in the crisis, she was extremely uh, efficient and extremely well, uh, extremely good leader. Um, so, you know, what's the right thing to do in here? And um, so what we can lose if we don't consider women during the crisis management. Uh, what is interesting is that women are actually more often uh, disproportionately affected by the disaster. And that comes from the reason because they are mostly the main caregivers uh, and they uh, with not the caregivers to, to children, but also to, to the family members, to elderly. So, for example, in 2014, uh, during the Ebola epidemic in Liberia, uh, women were estimated to make up 75% of those who died uh, during the epidemic. Uh, and UNICEF also estimated that up to 60% of those who died in Sierra Leone were women as well. Uh, so, you know, it's 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 really high number if you compare. Um, women are also more, 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 more vulnerable to rape and domestic abuse during times of crisis. So some of the solutions that are being created for, for people, for refugees that are potentially fleeing from places, they need to also include the solutions that are fit to women. So, for example, one of the um, one of the case was um, the storm shelters in Bangladesh, where uh, there wasn't a, a separated sex um, changing room for for toilets. Uh, uh, sorry, mixed um, mixed sex toilets. So uh, it was very unsuitable for women who would not normally be mixing with men. Um, and and it created quite a lot of dangerous situations for them because they were really exposed. Um, so they they just didn't go to the shelters, they didn't go to the toilets, uh, and that you know causes issues by itself. Um, and also uh, one of the other example that was given was a 1991 cyclone um, where the flood uh, and the death rate for women was five times more than that of a man. Um, and with with the, the example closer to home in UK, uh, the government was actually criticised for handling the lockdowns during the COVID times, uh, and the the the, the reason and uh, the decision that was made to to close schools, and it was suggested that the, the key decision makers were actually male because none of them thought what kind of impact um, it will have on the primary parents who are typically women, because they will be the ones most often staying at home. Uh, and taking care of kids or or trying to to put them through the school system or through school uh, tasks that they will be assigned to. So that was that was quite interesting as well. That it's um it's it's happening. Um, so um there is typically a reluctance to factor in in gender differences in disaster management, uh, as it's seen as a more social problem to solve. Um, however, what we've seen and what I was just uh, talking about is that women are more likely to be able to come up with solutions to a crisis that work for women. So it's extremely important to in the team that comes up with the solutions to have women because that will just basically make it more inclusive and the outcomes potentially could be much less worse than what we had, what we have seen that that happened in uh, in some of the epidemic and other uh, other disasters. OK, so. Um, what can we do? Is there anything we can do at the moment? Well, I think, you know, the fact that you're here on the webinar and you're interested in a subject that already 
uh, is very good and very promising. Um, Google coined this term called unbiasing. Uh, uh, so it's more about what we can do in our work environments, what we can do as a people. And some of the examples they gave was uh, build work environments, embracing differences. So consciously as a leader or as a manager, choosing teams that are different to you, that have different views to you, so they can challenge you, they can show you words from different perspectives. Um, step out of comfort zone when looking for co-workers, opinion bosses, you know, don't, don't go to the same people that you always go, go to different people and ask them. And even if you don't like the answer, think about it and try to think maybe, you know, maybe it does make sense. Maybe I should think about it from different perspective. Um, try to think what about your unconscious biases. What is it? I know I have plenty and there is a lot of time when, you know, I look at something and I have to think, oh, it's not really fair to think like this. So you can catch yourself on doing these things. And then as long as you realize it and, and you know this is your bias and it's not really, you know, that's something you can change. Um, uh, you can also raise awareness about unconscious bias, so you can speak with people, you can challenge their views in the discussions, you can prove to them that, you know, that they are um, showing the, the bias against uh, something or someone. Um, you can also hold everyone accountable, so if if you come across it, just state it, tell them it's not fair to do this, it's not okay. Um, and also gather data and measure decisions, and that specifically relates to the organizations that you work at. So without the data and without understanding how the decisions are made, you cannot understand if there is any kind of a bias going on in the background. Um, so that's quite a useful thing to do and also to, to see how it changes throughout the time. So there's a lot of things we can do at the moment, us as, a, as a individuals and also us as organizations. Um, and that's pretty much it from my side. So um, if anyone has any questions, I will be happy to take them. I think there were quite interesting comments um, from Simon with regards to the blind recruitment should be the norm, 100%. And then uh, from Robert, an example of blind recruitment, implementing auditions. <laughs> yes. I've, I've, I've seen that research as well about the, the musicians. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Robert, and thank you. Um, Thank you, Simon. I think we have um, something come up, coming up from Einar. <laughs> Thank you very much, Einar. <laughs> so yeah, if if you have any questions, feel free feel free to to write in the chat or or ask me. In, um, I'm not sure if you can unmute or if it's automatic actually, but um, chat is good a good place to ask as well. We have coming. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Did you did you read it all? Oh, okay. You just enabled. Okay, so I know the question whether um uh, how do you think we shall fight against bias? Is it even possible? Yes, I know. And, and you know, the last slide I shared with with what we can do as 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 individuals and as as an organization, it's it's definitely showing that. So, you know, the good start is always doing some reading. Um, and uh, when I was preparing for for the presentation and for the for the paper itself, I, I read quite a few book about biases and and how we can fight against them and and being informed being conscious in your decisions it's always a good start so um just thinking about you know some of the some of the things that that come to your head when you see a certain situation or a certain people and whether you tend to think about them negatively or positively and why would be that the issue uh, and also in in the team like i mentioned you know if you have if you are a manager if you are the one recruiting the team you know what are your criteria to to recruit this team whether you are objective and and you are looking for diversity in your team and in your organization as well because we now have a conscious choice of choosing to work for organizations that are more diverse um so so there's yeah there's there's a lot of things we can do for sure definitely 
thank you, Eric. Thanks a lot for listening. Have some more questions. OK, so another um, comment from Einer was um, I faced the, with bias as a woman from men and cannot sometimes change their thoughts. Yes, and you know, I work in the oil and gas, gas industry and that's something that I come across quite often as well. And and the only thing is is that I tend to think in that kind of situation is just to endure and to stay and to fight and to be there, to be present and to be strong and to get to, to the leadership position and show them that, you know, their things can be done in a different way. So I um I think that's that's the, the best thing you can do really <laughs> to show that you, you know, there will be a bias. And I know I, I understand that you know people work in different environments. Uh, but that's that's the best thing you can do. <laughs> okay, so there's some questions about the recording. So yes, this is recorded. So we will share it on the website. Thank you, Sina, for your comment. But very interesting and thought provoking. Any other questions? OK, so there's another question from uh, Pradeep Kumar about how important is it to assess skills and competencies in the recruitment process, or is it also a symptom, symptom of bias? Where it isn't actually, because what we were, I was talking about earlier is was the fact that we do, we, you know, the best thing to do is to choose people on merit. So rather than looking at whether they are men or women, or whether they they um, they fit the profile that that we think we should have, they should finish certain schools, or we definitely should look at what they represent, like the skills and competencies that they have. So it doesn't matter which background they come from. If they represent the skills and, and competencies that we are looking for, we should give them a chance, um, you know, to to come for an interview and, and represent their skills. So I I wouldn't see this as a symptom of bias. I would actually see this as as the best best way to to do your recruitment process to look at skills and competencies rather than a person as itself. Um, and then as Simon made the statement, um, if a baby can demonstrate bias, as you stated, then what can be done to elevate the bias at the early development stages? This is a really good question, um, Simon, and that's something I was actually discussing with my friend who um, has two young children. Um, and unfortunately, her children was showing signs of that, uh, and she was horrified because she never thought that would be the case. Um, and from what I know, and you know, I try to do with my 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 child as well, is to expose them to different kinds of environments. So you know, go out, meet different people, make sure that they are meeting different people, and they can see people being around them, and they can see this as being a normal working environment, normal you know, normal normal world that we are living in. Um, that that will change their view of you know seeing people in a certain situations. Or um, I don't know if you noticed, but some of the uh, quite a lot of books nowadays for kids. They have quite a lot of diversity in them as well. So kids are not only looking at you know uh, 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 characters that are similar to them. They have a range of characters that present that are, are, are presented in the book. So so there's few things that we can do at the early stage. Um, definitely. Okay, any other questions? Do we have? Stop sharing. Now. Oh, thank you, Robert. <laughs> That's a really nice comment. I'm glad you liked it, and uh, I, I, I'm glad that uh, I was able to share some good books with you as well. Okay. I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, I will just move to the last slide where you can see my email. Um, so. Um, if you have any further questions or any you know points that you would like to discuss or, or raise, um, my email is there on the screen, so please feel free to write. Um, I will be very glad to hear from you. And thank you very much for joining today. <laughs>